I don't know if you're going to be able to zoom in on that. This is a 0 0.5 milligram. What's up guys, Derek, moreplates18.com. Today we're going to be talking about hair loss prevention and what I am personally doing. This is a video I typically do um, once every year or two. I don't know, year, year and a half, something like that. Um, about what I am doing, people often ask, what is my current updated regimen, updated thoughts on things, and just general overarching views on the way pharmacology has evolved over the years and upcoming, you know, novel therapeutic interventions that are in the pipeline for hair, lo hair loss prevention that could potentially be less side effect ridden alternatives to things like, you know, finasteride, RU58841, CBO301 is another topical antiandrogen that's been being pushed through. There was, I believe, pyrolutamide is a topical antiandrogen of note lately as well, which uh, I could do a video on too if you guys want to know more about that because I have not yet seen um, that much insightful, you know, digging into it. It's not like there's a lot of people logging it as far as I know. And um, the binding affinity in question, the binding constant, it's uh, you know mechanism of action. Is it steroidal? Is it non-steroidal? These are things that I would want to know personally, and uh, you know maybe worthwhile to do a video on. So, anyways, as far as what I'm doing, things have become a lot more simple as of the past year. If you recall, you know a year and a half, two years ago, I was experimenting with tons of shit. I was doing you know nandrolone for HRT as an alternative to test with exogenous estradiol, wild experiment that I've never seen anybody really replicate. Um, well, actually since then I've seen sort of like through the grapevine a few, you know, examples and um, the, like some of the extreme protocols like that that have come up, you know, things like, uh, I also talk about, you know, PGD2 antagonists, some of the more novel ones and more useful ones like OC000459, um, Fevi Piperont, a lot of different stuff has come up on my radar over, radar over the past few years. And, you know, I've tried basically everything at this point. Um, I can't say that I've tried everything extremely thoroughly to a point that I can rule out everything necessarily that I discuss entirely. However, I do give myself like a pretty fucking good chance to see if stuff works, if it's going to move the needle or not and uh, before I kind of decide if it's gonna be in my routine or not. And ideally it's something that is, um, I don't know, has like years of anecdotal experience behind it at least because there is not a lot of shit out there and some of the more novel stuff does not have a lot of clinical research and you know findings to really support their efficacy. Oftentimes it's like us experimenting with shit. So anyways, as far as like what moves the needle and what I've been doing, a lot of my limitations have come around the actual application of this stuff and just consistently adhering to it in the past year more so, because for me, my schedule has become a lot more cumbersome to a point where I was posting two videos a day and it was actually getting quite problematic to do things like microneedling, for example, which I do think is a, this is the Derminator 2 that I used to use religiously and that I still use when I can, but unfortunately when I do use it, you know, it leaves my scalp red and inflamed for a couple days because I'm literally stabbing 1.5 millimeter deep holes in my head and literally drawing blood. And for me, being somebody who's like on camera almost every day, um, especially when I was doing two videos a day, which is something I may be ramping back up to, it was just like a another fucking thing to do every day that was getting to be a bit much. Now again, if I was using minoxidil, this would be an absolute must in my opinion. This is something that I would absolutely be implementing due to the literal doubling of results you can experience with minoxidil. People that are non-responders to minoxidil being converted to responders. It is the most efficacious intervention that is non-hormonal or non-pharmaceutical that you can introduce to a regimen alongside growth stimulant like minoxidil. So for me, it's a bit less imperative that I use it because I'm mainly using it to recruit growth factors as opposed to encouraging minoxidil absorption and getting that kind of like, I don't know, one plus one equals three effect that you otherwise see in the literature with derma rolling plus um, slash microneedling plus minoxidil. Because for me, I'm just microneedling. Reason being, minoxidil is something, again, that you need to basically be ready to commit to it for life if you're going to be using it, in my opinion. This is something that 
is often stated to be the introductory thing that you should be using first. Like, oh, get on Rogaine. Like a lot of people don't even realize Rogaine and Minoxidil, like what the difference is. It's the same thing. Rogaine's just brand name Minoxidil. Minoxidil is the drug and it's sold via different companies. Kirkland, um, company that does Rogaine. There's a bunch of different companies. Um, this video, I'm actually gonna be discussing our Minoxidil preparation. We designed Intelligent Minoxidil um, shortly. But for me, the reason I don't use it is because it requires, well, you can probably get away with once a day due to the long topical half-life. However, for me, even adhering to topicals has been difficult this past year with the intensive filming schedule. So for me, one of my main go-to treatments was RU58841. You're just, it's not like this is a brand name bottle or something. This is like literally just a fucking generic sprayer that I use to, you know, shake my RU in and then apply it with the sprayer to get a more more coverage because I am a uh, diffuse thinner. So for me, RU is something that was a big um, piece of my protocol. But for me too, I've been more intermittent with my topicals regimen this past year because of my intensive filming schedule. Like when I wake up and my hair's all done and shit, it can be quite annoying to have to get up, apply topicals, fix your hair again, you know, go work, like shower or, and apply your topicals again, go to bed. Like the, in, the amount of time, like it was so much easier to just wake up, my hair is done and I'm like ready to film essentially versus the, you know, as it may seem like a not that burdensome task to do topicals and do your hair a couple more times, or I guess every day. But I mean, for me, it was just getting to a point that was eating up a decent chunk of my day and it was just like another thing on my to-do list, you know, like I already have to deal with like, like as dumb as it sounds, literally eating meals is fucking time consuming, bro. So for me, topical adherence is something that normally I would be on top of it. And I actually saw a regression during the time that I was not on top of it, unfortunately. So for me, that's the only reason why I couldn't do minoxidil is because I knew that there was a large likelihood that I would fall off of my consistency. And once you fall off from minoxidil use, you're inducing a shedding phase, unfortunately. It's the unfortunate commitment requirements of minoxidil that once you start it, you gotta be ready to be using it like pretty much every day. Like sure, you have some buildup once it achieves steady state, but once you've given yourself enough days off and it's working its way out of your system, you're going to induce telogen effluvium because minoxidil is unique in that it induces a shifting in the hair cycle, hair life cycle when you start applying it to a point that it shifts your hairs into a shedding phase to then make room for better, more prolonged antigen phases in the future. But if you're like coming on and off of it consistently, you're basically inducing like pseudo states of telogen effluvium consistently to a point that you're never going to achieve homeostasis. So for me, until I can get to a point that I know for sure I'm not going to fall off of my schedule of applying it every single day. I'm not going to be using it. It's not because I don't believe it, believe in it, not because I don't think it's efficacious. It's the most completely blows everything else out of the water growth stimulant out there by far. It is well tolerated. It is, you know, FDA approved. It's like the best fucking thing you could be using for growth, especially if you're somebody who has recession with dead zones in your temples. This plus micro needling biggest game changer for actually regrowing dead zones like things like finasteride dutasteride ru 58841 recovering dead zones highly unlikely you're probably preventing further loss and getting back some lost ground to an extent but that's wishful thinking to think you're going to regrow like totally dead zones just from anti-androgens 5-alpha reductase inhibitors etc so that's where novel like actual good growth stimulants like minoxidil come into play or you know, there's other things that are worth looking at, but I think ultimately pale in comparison at the end of the day, like other growth stimulants that are worth looking at um, do exist, but I do think that minoxidil is the main needle mover bar none with the most clinical evidence to support its efficacy and safety profile. Now, again, it's not side effect free though either. This is something that when I first use it, you know, I gained some water weight, which I imagine would have eventually tapered off and reached some sort of homeostasis had I been consistent. But again, the main concern is the induced shedding phases. Um, there is some speculation about, you know, collagen synthesis and things of this nature, which largely are disproved when you look in the literature. However, anecdotal reviews do, you know, find consistent, like little interesting tidbits when it comes to minoxidil side effects, but ultimately like heart palpitations, also a notable one, which is not 
something to scoff at, you know, it's something to be to note and keep a close eye on. But again, the prevalence of this is not that common. So like, you know, there are people who will experience it to a point that you'll find a lot of reports of it online, but a lot of this, a lot of the time it's people who are, you know, experiencing side effects that end up going online to talk about it to begin with, or people who didn't respond well or whatever. And you'll find them, you know, congregating in forums and whatnot to talk about it, which is fine. Like it's definitely good to talk about what the worst case scenarios are, but ultimately the majority of the people who are using this stuff will find it to be side effect free and get good results from it in conjunction with microneedling. And that's why the number one growth stimulant you could possibly be using, in my opinion, still to this day is microneedling. The reason I would recommend the Derminator is because ultimately this is, like I said, a lifelong commitment when you're using minoxidil. So if you're gonna be committing this to committing to this for life, microneedling is also something that you're presumably going to be committing to, to life, for life too, once a week at least with an adequate depth and getting that done in the most efficient way possible, achieving the precise depth rather than relying on your, you know, not pressing too hard with your hand or whatever, getting it done 10 times as fast, using a literally el electronically dictated process rather than manually rolling shit over your head and literally just having a robot like fucking jab this thing through your head at a million miles an hour. This Derminator 2, I think, is well worth the money, although it is definitely more cost prohibitive than a roller. But again, you probably shouldn't be using these two things to begin with if you're not committing to it for life. So I do think the investment on it is definitely worth it and pays itself off um, very soon, pays itself in dividends with your time investment you get back, as well as the lack of pain too, because the pain associated is not like the funnest thing. and. You're kind of prolonging it when you're using a slow fucking rolling process. So anyways, for growth stimulants, I would recommend minoxidil and microneedling. But after you introduce some sort of inhibition of androgen-induced miniaturization, because ultimately that is what's dictating your further loss is the 5-alpha reduction in your scalp from testosterone to DHT, and to a much, much lesser extent, the residual testosterone that's sitting in your scalp too. Um, and other byproduct androgens. And in addition to that, um, like what is the most mild thing you could be introducing for competing with androgens on the scalp? Um, for me, that is still the staple of ketoconazole shampoo. So this is a over-the-counter antifungal, anti, you know, it's pretty good for like irritation in scalps and just being a good shampoo. It's ideal to get a preparation that's not just like Nizerol is the most cost effective one. So by all means, if you want to go to Costco, Amazon, whatever, and get Nizerol, it's just straight up ketoconazole shampoo, but with no other ingredients. However, as mentioned many times on this channel, I found it very drying, makes your hair look malnourished and shittier. So I've always opted for a high quality ketoconazole shampoo. And this is the one I am using currently. Um, this one has ketoconazole as well as an array of other ingredients in it that ultimately the main thing I look for in the ketoconazole shampoos is what's it make my hair look like after using it and does it have an adequate amount of ketoconazole in it? And that's, you know, fulfilling what I need out of it because Nizrol, I just can't tolerate it very well. But if you want to be more cost efficient, Nizrol, and you can tolerate it just fine by all means. So anyways, ketoconazole shampoo, I think is the entry level Super easy thing that pretty much anyone can add in because it's non-pharmaceutical. There's no prescription. It's over the counter. It's like a fucking non-existent side effect profile. And then the next thing after that when you get into heavy needle movers is finasteride, 5-alpha reductase inhibition. I would recommend this typically over a topical antiandrogen. However, this is context dependent, individual dependent. Some people do better with topical antiandrogens depending on skin porosity existing hormonal profile, a myriad of different things. Like some people literally will get gyno from finasteride. It's not common, but it definitely does happen. So these are all things to consider. But in general, for the majority of individuals who have healthy functioning bodies, um, good, you know, gene expression, good methylation, good, you know, hormone status, good androgen to estrogen balance, finasteride is usually the first introductory main, main needle mover that is going to inhibit a significant chunk of DHT conversion in your scalp. Now, again, does this have any consequences on dick function, on, you know, myriad of different things? Muscle growth, well, I can say for certain, doesn't have anything to do with muscle growth whatsoever. I've proven this many times in previous videos. And if you want to know my stance on finasteride, should you take it, should you not take it, do not take this video as a stance on if you should take it or should you not. I did a video a long time ago called 
Finasteride, should you take it, yes or no? And that one I break down with elaborate detail exactly how you can come to the conclusion if it's a good decision for you or not. Watch that video, because if I do it in this one, this is going to be a giant Finasteride dedicated video essentially that will be 40 minutes long. So anyways, what am I doing? I was on Finasteride for a while. Now again, RU5841, topical antiandrogen that I think is very good still. It's not the most research backed, unfortunately, with lack of human data. And hopefully some of these new novel anti-androgens anti -androgens that are coming out are going to phase this out entirely because I would love to have a like human research backed, totally safe, well tolerated topical anti-androgen that doesn't go systemic and is just fucking great. And it's cost efficient, hopefully, um, as a replacement because I've been using RU for years at this point and uh, I have not yet found a better topical anti-androgen to date. So that's what I've stuck with. However, again, like I mentioned, the posting schedule has really actually prevented me from being too consistent with this. I used to be much more on the ball with doing it every single night at a point even twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. That's what I was doing for a while when I was like full blown, like perfect on the money with my adherence to everything. So until I would ever get to that point again, that's the time when I would consider minoxidil again, but I'm not there right now with my current filming schedule, my current uh, commitments in life. So for me, not happening right now. But if I do get there, um, and I'm ready to like really dive in and commit for life. That's where the minoxidil will be reintroduced. And I think that would be something that could get me pretty close to, you know, potentially, um, like I think if I did microneedling minoxidil, I could get close enough to a baseline where I might not even want to do a hair transplant. You know, that remains to be seen because I've seen some pretty astonishing before and afters with microneedling minoxidil. But again, do I want to be on minoxidil forever? Do I want a microneedle forever? I don't really know yet. You know, it's not that big of a deal to do it, to be honest. Like it's actually pretty easy to apply. It's just the fact that for me, like I have a unique situation in that I am on camera like every goddamn day. So for me, even little bits of time are very valuable to me at this point. I try to outsource literally everything I do. And, um, you know, eating up valuable chunks of time is like actually is like pieces of hours that like I don't want to give up as insane as that sounds. So. For me, I actually made a change recently on the needle mover finasteride to account for the fact that I've been less consistent with my RU, and that is switching to oral dutasteride. I don't know if you're gonna be able to zoom in on that. This is a 0.5 milligram dutasteride soft gel. I just switched to it like a couple of weeks ago. This is a new change in my protocol. However, I have done dutasteride before for over a year. And um, I do, like it was well tolerated for me, fortunately. Now again, it's even more side effect ridden than finasteride because you're in literally inhibiting 90 plus percent of DHT systemically. It's kind of interesting though, because scalp DHT, there is a big disparity between the two. And there is a lot of debate as to the importance of the three isoforms of 5-alpha reductase, how much they're expressed in the scalp in adults and how much dutasteride really makes a difference compared to finasteride. Now for me, I do believe dutasteride is more effective than finasteride and this is proven in the literature. However, to what extent it is, seems to be somewhat individual dependent. Um, I do believe this is partially due to um, isoforms, density of them, and the gene expression that is individual dependent for certain people. Like again, hormonal status, density of enzyme activity in certain tissues. It's all going to differ individual to individual. Like why do some people get gyno with normal test and estrogen levels on paper and some don't? Like ultimately there's like intra tissue aromatization causing glandular development and other downstream cascades that cause proliferative, proliferative, can't even fucking talk, proliferative effects that lead to a titty developing. But for some guys, they can literally like blast like a gramma test without an AI and not end up with Gyno, like this is the disparity in genetic response to stuff and just natural, you know, hormone production and natural response to hormones in tissues themselves. So again, if somebody, and this sort of boils down to when you would use a topical antiandrogen versus a 5 valve reductase inhibitor. For me, the application of this was to kind of bulletproof against the in increase in scalp testosterone production not production, but scalp testosterone levels that occur when you use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. When you use finasteride, your testosterone levels and estrogen levels will increase by about 15%. When you use dutasteride, they'll increase by about 22%. This number is going to differ, you know, individual to individual. This is just the numbers I recall off the top of my head from the literature that I have read. So again, that subsequent spike in scalp testosterone, I believe it was like it might have even been like a 100% increase in scalp T. I could be wrong on that. I know systemically those are the increases, the 15%, but at the end of the day, 
Um, I'm not immune to scalp testosterone miniaturizing hair follicles too, so for me, and obviously there is residual DHT. So again, any kind of extra backup help I could get was worthwhile. So for me, I saw good results when I introduced RU58 for one personally, um, and that is the main reason it's stuck in my protocol after like I tried RU solo, finasteride solo, RU plus, RU plus finasteride, et cetera, all of these different combinations of things. And for me, the mechanism and why I justify using a topical antiandrogen that is well tolerated, because again, I wouldn't use this shit if it gave me debilitating side effects or any noticeable side effects, frankly, at all, is that it kind of like mops up the increase in scalp testosterone that occurs after the inhibition of 5-alpha reduction. So when you inhibit testosterone converting to DHT, you have this testosterone, otherwise would have converted to DHT. You have more testosterone now. This is still androgenic in itself. In addition, it also has more testosterone to aromatize into estrogen, which you know is the cause of gyno in a lot of individuals that otherwise didn't have gyno before they used finasteride. Is this common? No, but it does happen. It's worth noting nonetheless. And it sort of boils down again to my video on should you use finasteride, yes or no, that video. And a lot of my old hair loss videos will more like parse out and dissect in elaborate detail the answers to some of the questions that are probably arising while I'm talking right now. So again, trying to reel myself back and talk about just the protocol. Micro needling basically for me is not very common now. However, I do do it, but it's very, very infrequent to a point that I don't really know if it would make a difference if I pulled it out entirely at this point because it's so infrequent. But for me, I do deem it worthwhile to be using with and without minoxidil, at least for now. I think it's more worthwhile for minoxidil users, users than non-minoxidil users though, to be honest. And if you want more details on why or what that even entails, go watch my videos, hair loss prevention playlist. It's in descending order of basically the oldest videos are like my oldest thoughts on things to my most recent videos have my newest thoughts. Highly recommend you go in descending order of like chronological order from the newest down to the oldest rather than vice versa. Cause you will have outdated thoughts if you go read or look at my old shit. Uh, minoxidil, again, and this is a shameless plug too for our intelligent minoxidil. This is something that also was a big deterrent from me using it is the fact that when I first got into the hair loss prevention space, all of these brands had like really shitty, like greasy minoxidil that wouldn't dry quick. So if this is something I'm going to use twice a day and adhere to for the rest of my life, it needs to be something that I can then do my hair after and have it look dry, clean, and not greasy after. And Kirkland minoxidil in particular was the first bad experience I had personally, because I have tried it, although for a short bout, and I have tons of friends who've tried it, and obviously a million, like, not millions, like thousands of fucking anecdotal reports I found at this point, and friends of mine who use it. And um, the, most of the standard minoxidil preparations do not dry quick, and they are greasy, and this is like a big limitation, because how are you supposed to be presentable in day-to-day -day life when you are applying this stuff every day, and there's like no period of time when this stuff is not like making your hair look shitty. So for me, this is something I would never do if I did not have fast drying and non-greasy minoxidil. So what makes ours intelligent, you know, the prefix of our products, it's intelligent.shop is the website and all the products we make are intelligent by nature. It is because of the fast drying, non-greasy preparation itself. So it's not necessarily a different purity. We're not selling, you know, like a legal 10% minoxidil or something. Which, to be honest, again, is something you can only get through a compounding pharmacy and at the end of the day is not necessarily that much more efficacious seemingly in the literature. So 5% I think is still like the most well tolerated, most safety, best safety profile and fortunately legal and over the counter and FDA approved with fucking millions of users. Um, and it works very, very well when you respond to it. This is something I definitely would be using if I could commit to it. And I am at least optimistic as hell that I have this up my sleeve with this, should I ever need to deploy it. Because for me, I'm kind of just like content where I'm at. You know, I'd love to get closer to baseline for sure though. And that is sort of where minoxyl and or a transplant may be, you know, in the pipeline in the future. But for now, with my schedule, I'm kind of just back into work, dude, so. But anyways, that is something I would definitely highly recommend checking out our intelligent minoxidil. Link in the video description below with a coupon code to save some money. And that is what sets us apart and makes it intelligent is the preparation and how greasy, not greasy it is relative to other greasy formulas and the fast drying nature that actually allows you to live a normal life and not have your hair look like shit whilst you are inducing super physiological growth in your scalp. And as far as the RU5841, how much am I using it? 
Um, I should be using it more. Like I said, this is something I used to be very, very meticulous about adhering to, but that was back when I wasn't posting two videos a day. Nowadays, um, I'm very, very infrequent with its use. Some days better than others. Like sometimes I go on a streak of using it like multiple days in a row and then I'll have a couple days off and I'll do it again. And you know, it's very intermittent though. And I would not, I don't consider it like being fully getting the effects out of it unless you're using it like consistently every day. So for me, um, like by the time I get, I'm so burnt out sometimes after working all day that when I get to my sink, like extra steps, like you brush, you floss, you moisturize, you do this, you do that. It's like so much extra shit and I'm just like, fuck it. I don't want to do it. So I would do it. Otherwise, if my schedule or just my, I don't know, I allocated more of my day towards being, uh, I don't know, on point with literally everything. But um, that's just how it's been the past year. Well, I've been doing two videos a day. Maybe that'll change in the future, but in an ideal world, I would be doing this twice a day, this once a day at least, this once a week. Um, but that's just how I've been doing it. So that's my update personally. I'm doing this still every single time in the shower. Keep the console shampoo and leave it in for 10 plus minutes after lathering it. And then the Dutasteride being the main needle mover in this right now. This is the only thing I can easily consistently adhere to because I'm literally just popping it in my mouth. Now, topical Dutasteride, Check out my video on topical dutasteride if you haven't seen it. This is potentially a more viable alternative than even topical finasteride maybe. Like it kind of depends on what we see in the manifestation of changes in blood work and um, side effect profile and whatnot. Some people they seem to get, you know what, go, <laughs> I'm about to talk for another 10 minutes if I talk about it. So like I have so many videos at this point with such elaborate detail on all of this stuff. Please just watch my playlist, but basically Oral dutasteride crushes systemic DHT by a shitload, significantly more than oral finasteride. Finasteride on its own might do like 60 to 70%. Even 70% is like maximum at a five milligram ProScar dose. 0 0.5 milligrams dutasteride now inhibits the additional, um, the third isoform of 5-alpha reductase and crushes DHT by 90, 99%, 90 to 99%. Um, upwards of like two and a half milligrams of dutasteride is like the heaviest hitting dose found in the literature that they've at least tested in humans that crushes scalp DHT levels by the maximum amount. And um, yeah, so for me, just having something heavy hitting to deal with DHT, and fortunately I don't get side effects, you know, some of the inhibition of neurosteroids and whatnot that you even like keep when you're on finasteride, like finasteride in itself already inhibits you know, certain things that can be problematic in the eyes of many for, you know, post finasteride syndrome and this and that. But for me, dutasteride fortunately was well tolerated for that year that I was using it. And that is kind of what I use as a justification to be including it now, given the lack of extra support that I used to get from this for excess DHT, rise in scalp tea, stuff like that. So anyways, right now my, my main stack is basically ketoconazole shampoo, dutasteride, but in an ideal world, it would also be Everyday RU or one of these new topical antiandrogens that hopefully gets FDA approved, intelligent minoxidil, microneedling. And I think honestly, if you're somebody who is proactive about this and gets on top of it early enough, like some of this stuff, you could get away with such a minimal amount, like an entry level of dose of finasteride, perhaps maybe minoxidil, maybe not. You might not even need minoxidil because again, prevention is worth an ounce of cure, I believe is the saying. If you prevent your hair loss from occurring in the first place, you probably don't even need minoxidil at the end of the day because that is a growth stimulant. So uh, prevention is way more effective than trying to make up ground. Take it from me, take it from anybody who is, uh, you know, in the hair loss space or has experienced significant amounts of hair loss and is playing catch up. If you prevented it earlier, you would be in a way better position where you don't need to be doing, you know, microneedling, where you don't need to be doing minoxidil and whatnot. But a lot of people, you know, they catch it once they've noticed it, which unfortunately usually happens once you've lost like 30 to 40% of your fucking scalp already, which sucks. You know, you see yourself randomly in downlighting one day in a photo, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you notice, oh shit, I can see my scalp. Was my hairline always this bad? What the fuck is going on? And at that point, you are playing catch up a little bit. And that's where a big three stack, if you haven't seen my big three stack videos, go check those out. But in general, like most people are going to be utilizing something like a ketoconazole shampoo plus finasteride or a new topical antiandrogen that becomes FDA approved is usually what people will end up doing. 
there are you know certain individual specific scenarios but ultimately those are going to be the best prevention routes and then things like minoxidil are stacked on top microneedling more aggressive 5 alpha reductase inhibition topical dutasteride oral dutasteride stuff like that is more like advanced and likely unnecessary if you catch this early enough and educate yourself about it thoroughly ahead of time so that's what i'm doing right now uh hopefully you guys enjoyed it hopefully you learned something if you're new to the channel Highly recommend if your like head is spinning and what the fuck I'm talking about, please go watch my hair loss prevention playlist. I have dedicated countless hours to researching this stuff in elaborate detail and putting my thoughts and findings into videos. And again, some of this stuff, I can't even recall all the things I've done off the top of my head, all of my findings. This is why I log it in videos. And um, it's pretty in depth, dude. Like I've done some pretty crazy experiments and um, the results are very insightful for figuring out, you know, what is practically, I don't know, applicable for your own situation or just researching further because you're, you know, interested in it to the extent that I was. So anyways, like, subscribe. Thank you guys for watching. Check out my blog, moreplacemoreandates.com. Follow my Instagram, I'm moreplacemoreandates, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, couple podcasts. Um, if you want to support the channel, you can check out um, Intelligent Minoxidil. It is newly launched. Um, obviously, there are other Minoxidil preparations on the market. Um, this one ultimately supports me directly, though. It's very much appreciated when you guys support me and my uh, business endeavors and whatnot. And I try to put out products that I believe in and have the highest quality so for me, again, the intelligent part being the fast drying, non-greasy, this is how we set ourselves apart from the majority of companies in the industry on it. And uh, I hope you guys like it. If you're a Minoxidil user or you're somebody who's going to be using Minoxidil, check it out. It is newly launched. It's on the intelligent.shop site. And you can use the coupon code in the video description to save some money. Um, as well, if I can remember, I'll put a link to the microneedling device I use. Again, you can get a more cost-effective roller on Amazon. There's nothing wrong with them, but for the reasons I outlined earlier in the video, as well as in my countless other videos, there's a reason why I use this thing in particular. Um, link to the ketoconazole shampoo I'm using currently, as well as my uh, preventative medicine HRT clinic, which you can um, get connected with doctors who will evaluate your biomarkers, hormone, hormone profile, etc., and you can otherwise get access to pharmaceutical grade medications like finasteride and uh, you know perhaps even you know topical dutasteride and things like that will be available in the future too which are worthwhile to dig into for sure so anyways you can check all that stuff out and um yeah talk to you guys soon